Photocon pressurizing on. Photocon pressurizing on. T minus 20 seconds. 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 10. We have go for main engine start. 8, 7, 6. We have main engine start. 3, 2, 1. Solid motor ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of Columbia and the first flight of the European Space Agency's space lab. The shuttle has cleared the tower. Roger, roll. This is the story of an expedition, the flight of STS-9, the Columbia. And these are the explorers, John Young, the commander, Brewster Shaw, the shuttle pilot, and the scientists, Drs. Ulf Merbold, Byron Lichtenberg, Robert Parker, and Dr. Owen Garriott, an astronaut who also is amateur radio operator, W5LFL. Roger on the PC. This is an expedition to probe the outer limits of science and amateur radio's newest frontier. Space is the new frontier, finally made available to everyone by a flying machine, the space shuttle. In orbit, astronauts floated effortlessly into the space lab to fire up a billion dollars worth of scientific equipment. On Earth, thousands of amateur radio operators, hams, prepared for their first man in space. I've never seen the ham radio community so excited. For the first time, we're actually getting to talk to somebody live in space. Challenge the 1980s marked the true beginning of the space adventure. age. Astronauts work and play in orbit. They even launch satellites from the cargo hold of their spaceships. For example, this one's a hundred million dollar commercial satellite that will relay telephone, television, and computer communications. Uh, that's real pretty, that's my first view of it. Beautiful. What is it now? On Earth today, boys and girls can dream of space, knowing their dreams can come true. These are Explorer Scouts at the Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland. They're assembling 10 experiments, from tracking cosmic rays to growing crystals. Their tiny version of a space lab will be carried on a future mission as a getaway special. In Space Talk, the getaway special canisters on the shuttle are called gas cans. Looks like those gas canisters are, in fact, going to be running. I hope they get good results from them. I think it's a, a great opportunity. The Space Lab astronauts trained at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, where the radio clubs at work on another getaway special, one that will use amateur radio to control and report a series of experiments prepared by students at the University of Alabama. Their amateur radio even speaks as it transmits data. Time zero, 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 one, four, eight, data, two, five, five, the gas cans have made it possible for the public to buy into space and send up almost anything within reason except people. Space is still the exclusive province of astronauts and specially trained scientists and engineers. I'm Roy Neal, K6DUE, and I've been covering the space program since it began. In those early days, people used to look through telescopes like this one and wonder what was up there. And then, 25 years ago, it all began to change.
The huge holds of today's space shuttles can carry as much cargo as an 18-wheeler rolling along the highways. They've opened the doors of space. But the real explorers remain the astronauts, the highly trained professionals who use computers to fly their spaceships and high technology to develop new ways of using space to better our way of life. And until the flight of STS-9, the communications links remained exclusive. Astronauts only talk to astronauts between mission control and orbiting spacecraft. Okay, uh, I activated it at uh, two days, 20 hours, 43 minutes, and as soon as we started the system status check... Get that Navy stuff mixed up. We can tell you're steely-eyed from here. During the expedition of STS-9, for the first time, the astronauts talked directly to scientists who were in a special control center in Houston using NASA channels. It was still very official. About uh, one meter for the decay rate, so I can't see any decay in the first meter or so. It's just too much of a single bright slide. And Space Lab Marshal, uh, Bob, you made our day down here. If you can copy, we're hearing nothing but superlatives from the CPAC team. Astronaut One of the astronauts, Dr. Out, Dr. Owen Garriott, also was given permission to talk informally using ham radio during time off. Dr. Garriott is W5LFL when he's not busy astronauting. He holds a doctor's degree in electrical engineering from Stanford. He signed on with NASA in 1965 and spent two months in space in Skylab, along with Alan Bean and Jack Lausmo on that historic flight. He took part in medical experiments. Studied solar flares, taking 40,000 sun pictures, and also shooting 16,000 more pictures of our Earth to find out more about how it works. They even found time for play. But NASA would not let him take ham gear into space. With the coming of age of the space shuttle, finally permission was granted. Before the flight, Gary had explained the station that he planned to use. This was a, has a 5 watt output and is connected uh, via a cable here that we can see running up to an overhead window. And uh, this is about a two foot square antenna in a little dish. And that antenna will radiate then outward above the spacecraft. And of course we will want to make sure the spacecraft then is oriented in such a way that that antenna is pointed in some direction uh, toward the Earth. And then we can communicate from this transceiver out through the antenna and back again. Now we have another little box here which connects, interconnects uh, several uh, different elements. First of all, it interconnects to my headset. And so I have a little lightweight headset which is just like the one I use for all of my communications on board uh, the Columbia and Space Lab. As a matter of fact, I really don't even have to change headsets. I just uh, disconnect the cable from my Space Lab uh, unit and plug it into this little interface box and it connects my standard headset into the transceiver. Now we mentioned some logs a little bit ago. We need to log or make a record of all of the transmissions that both I make and signals that I receive. And I have a little, a small portable tran uh, uh, tape recorder on which that is done. And so I will have this Velcroed or attached to the transceiver and I will turn it on at the time I begin the transmissions and then it'll simply keep a verbal record for me of everything I say on the transceiver and everything I hear on the receiving portion of the unit. And uh, that is really all of the equipment that we need. On orbit day three, excitement peaked among hams all over the world. And then amateur radio's man in space went on the air. This is W5LFL in Columbia. W5LFL in Columbia, orbiting the Earth at an altitude of 135 nautical miles. Passing over the U.S. West Coast and calling CQ. W5LFL on SPS9, WA1JXN, WA1 Japan, X-ray Norway, WA1JXN, Frenchtown, Montana, standing by. Hello, W1JXN, WA1 
Juliet, X-ray November. This is W5 LFL. Uh, you're our first contact from uh, orbit. Uh, WA1, Juliet, X-ray November. Uh, how do you read, over? It was quite a thrill. I, I was very surprised when he came back and said that uh, quite clearly that I was the first contact from orbit. This is WB5 LMJ, Whiskey Bravo 5, Lima, Mike, Juliet in Lawton, Oklahoma, calling the Space Shuttle Columbia. KZ-17 calling W5 LFL, Kilo Alpha 7, Kilo Alpha 7, this is KZ-17, 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 this is W5IU, Whiskey 5 India Uniform, W5IU. The view of uh, California coming over the course here is just fantastic. We got about three people up at the window trying to take pictures all the while I'm trying to get the ham rig working here. Columbia W5 LFL, November 8th, Echo Echo Oscar at Sugar Grove Christian School. NA 5P. AL7W. AL7W. W5 LFL, this is W8 Alpha Hotel. Right now, I'm higher in the kite. I didn't really think that uh, we stood a chance of even hearing him. W6RCL, calling W5LFL. Hello, Owen. KD6YG. Calling CQ for Europe. Calling CQ Great Britain and the rest of Europe. This is W5 Lima, Foxtrot Lima in the spacecraft Columbia. GB3RS, Gulf Baker 3, Romeo Sierra. Kilo Bravo 1, Oscar at Avery Street School, calling W5LFL. This is KB1O. KB1O. This is W7 India, Denmark, W7ID in Idaho calling. W7 India, Denmark, your signals were among the strongest I've heard, uh, coming in very clearly, and several other stations which were too weak to copy. It was tremendously exciting. Uh, after I heard him answer my call, I just uh, sat back here and, uh, and didn't know what to do for several minutes and just listened to all the other stations calling him. About four minutes later, my family upstairs heard me jump up and let out a, a large uh, war hoop. <laughs> The reception up here is uh, pretty weak. I uh, was not able to uh, pick out as many stations as I wanted, but uh, certainly I was hearing them all the way from California to Mexico City and then a little bit later uh, uh, down into uh, Chile and Argentina. Woo! <laughs> Owen oh, Gary at W5LFL may have been the first amateur radio operator in space, but ham stations have been flying around unmanned up there for years. There's even an organization, the Amateur Satellite Corporation, AMSAT, that builds and operates them. They're called Oscars, orbiting satellites carrying amateur radio. Built by amateurs from all over the world, there have been 10 of these little communication satellites, becoming increasingly more capable and sophisticated over the years. They're used to relay or repeat ham signals from one side of the world to the other. AMSAT coordinated frequencies and shared technical responsibility for Garriott's STS-9 mission with the American Radio Relay League, the international organization that represents 400,000 amateurs in the United States and Canada. Remember these? Vacuum tubes, big ones. 80 years ago, their invention revolutionized the world of radio. Today, it's solid-state electronics, computers, microprocessors, games. Computers are changing our way of life by opening new avenues of thought and communication. Once, amateur radio operators opened the world of shortwave by pioneering new ways of using tubes. Today, their basic equipment is mostly solid state, transistorized, while computers make radios easier to operate. There are many specialized forms of communication, among them amateur TV. Hams even used these systems to watch NASA and to show one another what was going on aboard the Columbia. That's coming from NASA, from Johnson Space Center. There they are, right in the space shuttle right now. Hams use teletype. Hi, Bill. This is WA6PEA. Good to hear you. 
and repeaters, mountaintop relay stations that receive weak signals and retransmit them from handheld and car radios to give them louder voices and longer range. But most of all, ham radio operators are communicators. Each has a distinctive identification, a call sign. The late president of the ARRL, Vic Clark, was W4KFC. There are about one million and a half radio amateurs in the world, all licensed by their, their governments to operate on assigned frequencies that are agreed to internationally. The advantages, of course, of uh, being able to do this is that we radio amateurs are the only group of, of citizens in the world who can communicate freely across international borders, speaking with one another from the privacy of our own homes using our own equipment. The ARRL is headquartered in Newington, Connecticut where it operates a powerful radio station that transmits news and information, including code practice, in a worldwide service. Its call letters are W1AW. It publishes QST, a ham magazine devoted to telling amateurs what's going on in their world, and other publications such as a handbook, and books on how to get a license. The league's general manager is David AM Sumner, and his call is K1ZZ. Receiver at home. It is a technical hobby, but it's not one that uh, is that really should scare people away. Uh, most amateurs today uh, uh, are using equipment which is manufactured. They assemble it in into a station which meets their particular needs, but this isn't any different than, for example, the hi-fi enthusiast who has a wide variety of equipment available and puts together the components that uh, meets his particular needs. And I don't think most of us regard hi-fi as being that technical that, we'd, that we would shy away from it for that reason. W1AW, the league station, is elaborate, but most hams have smaller stations at home. They share the motivation that once led Owen Garriott to become a ham. The Johnson Space Center Ham Club here in Houston, Texas, and just... Owen still enjoys operating as he remembers how he got into ham radio. I was still in high school, and my dad came home from work one day and said, a friend of his up at the office was going to be teaching a code class, and would I like to come along with him? And so at that uh, point, having nothing too much else to do in the evenings, I started going to code class with my father for a period of, uh, oh, I guess three or four months at the uh, Enid Amateur Radio Club, still in existence, W5 Hot Tea Kettle in Enid, Oklahoma. And then uh, a few months later, he said, well, this uh, friend is also going to be teaching a theory class down at the local high school, and would I like to come along to that? So I was still game, and uh, my father and I ended up going through both the code and theory classes and uh, getting our licenses uh, just toward the end of World War II. So that's been quite a while. Owen Garriott became W5 LFL, then an electrical engineer, and finally an astronaut. And this is no question in my mind, but uh, way back in high school, uh, almost uh, an accidental event uh, with my father has certainly had a significant impact on uh, my professional career. STS-9 was truly an expedition into space. Owen Garriott and his teammates, Drs. Ulf Merbold, Byron Lichtenberg, and Bob Parker, and the pilots John Young and Brewster Shaw, performed flawlessly. They even stayed up there an extra day for a total of 10 to get maximum mileage from the spectacular space lab. Yeah, we're looking now, uh, at they studied stars in the sky, star field. Gary at now studied the their own bodies the as they adapted the, uh, to weightlessness. Barn, which is already attached to the floors. They showed us the Earth, the as seen from uh, Columbia. Behind the uh, space lab module. Uh, Michael, I guess we're coming over the west coast of the U.S. and uh, we say hello to all the people down in Oregon. Roger that, Ed. There's a lot of good snow down in the mountains in Oregon. Uh, ski season is fast approaching. Hey, firm. We'll have to get together on that a little, uh, little bit after the mission. Well, I wish you good luck for the melting of the silicon rod. We so looked over there. their shoulders to see what happens to molten chemicals. We even saw extreme close-ups of eyes while the astronauts put their heads in a box-like device to see if they got dizzy or sick. And at times, the eyes did show the effects. The, ten -member the space lab was built by a consortium of European nations. Thermal shielding of the space lab module. This is one heck of a conference call. President Reagan in Washington and West German Chancellor Helmut Kohl in Europe congratulated the crew. I know Chancellor Kohl agrees with me that this shuttle mission with its German and American crew represents the highest aspirations of our two people. 
When he wasn't working in Space Lab, Owen Garriott also found time to put on a spectacular demonstration of amateur radio. He talked to more than 300 stations all over the world, and some of the contacts were special. To his sons, standing by at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And he spoke to his mother while flying over Enid, Oklahoma. Oh, hi, son. Hello, mother. How are you this afternoon? Glad to talk to you. Uh, With the help of Australian ham station VK-1ORR and fellow astronaut Joe Kerwin, W5LFL even staged the demonstration of the way in which ham radio could be used in emergencies as backup spacecraft communication. W5LFL, W5LFL, this is Houston. We're here loud and clear, Owen. They have a super backup comm system. How do you copy us? And loud and clear, one of the best stations that we've heard ever since we've been in orbit. They're looking right straight down over Melbourne at just about this moment, this very moment. And uh, we just wanted to establish the fact that we could maintain a backup comm here. Gary had talked to some well-known amateur stations during his more than four hours of amateur communicating. The league headquarters station, W1AW, was one of them. It took three tries before contact finally was made. Whiskey 1 Alpha Whiskey, W1AW, over. This is, K this is Senator Barry Goldwater, K7UGA. Golf Alpha, copy, Owen. Uh, K7UGA, how do you read W5 Lima, Foxtrot Lima, over. Uh, Roger, Owen, W5 LFL, K7UGA here. Well, I'll tell you, old man, if you get job uh, tired of driving that rascal up there, you come down here and I'll trade your job. Hello, Amateur radio Thank transcends international w5 politics. Lima, While flying over Jordan, W5LFL contacted Lima, the King, Fox, Hussein, whose call sign is JY1. Hello, Whiskey 5 uh, Lima, Foxtrot uh, Lima. This is Juliet Yankee number one. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. This is W5 Lima, Foxtrot Lima coming right back. Your signals are 5 by 9 plus. I just passed over the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba. I'm uh, looking down on your country right at this time, sir. Is, uh, this is Royal Highness speaking, over. Uh, Whiskey 5 Lima, Foxtrot Lima. This is uh, Juliet Yankee 1, Hussein on the mic. Uh, right, sir, and we are very, very happy indeed uh, to hear you loud and clear. 5x9 also here in Amman, the capital city of Jordan. Ham radio operators exchange QSL cards to confirm their contacts. King Hussein's is a prize, but for a change, the king really wanted one from the other station, so he sent his JY1 card for it personal delivery by Carl Smith, W0BWJ, the president of the, of the American Radio Relay League. And congratulations on all of your work. Thank you, Carl. It's a real pleasure to have a chance to talk with uh, as enthusiastic a ham as is uh, Juliet Yankee number one. League headquarters was deluged by thousands of cards that came in from all over the world, from the operators who had called the Columbia or heard its signals. The fraternity of amateur radio embraced the experiment of a ham in space enthusiastically, perhaps because most amateurs look to space as an integral part of the future of their hobby and its service. When future astronauts go up to man-orbiting space stations, colonize the moon, and explore Mars, they will take communicators with them, including, of course, ham radio operators. These are some of the projects on the drawing boards of NASA. Wild looking? Perhaps, but not really, when compared to the space shuttle in the perspective of 50 years ago, when a comic strip character, Buck Rogers, was the model of an astronaut. One person in every 550 in the United States today is a ham radio operator, but a much higher percentage than that can expect to be part of the action in the future. Hams envision base stations on the moon, where exploration may be shared with NASA communications. The United States space program has a future, and ham radio should be a vital part of it. Owen Garriott's flawless performance in STS-9 has set the stage. I think the principal impact will be as a demonstration uh, to the uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, amateurs and hams, not only in the U.S., but all over the world, uh, that they can indeed play a personal role in uh, space activities. Uh, they've been doing it to some extent via the unmanned satellites, uh, OSCAR, which operate as repeaters, uh, but uh, now there'll be a chance for uh, uh, people, uh, persons, to really uh, be involved in two-way communications from space. 
17,000 feet, coming down to 128 feet per second, 10 miles from the runway. STS-9 was only a beginning. Dynamics officer the communicators of amateur radio are truly on their way to the new frontier of space. And no one, no one can predict exactly how far they'll go. Roy Neal, K6DUE. Very large turn around the heading alignment circle, 309 degrees. Okay, one second. Roger, surface winds are calm. 10,000 feet, dropping 170 feet per second, seven miles from runway. Columbia is on center line and on glide slope. on its final approach to the runway, five miles out. Still in manual flight control mode. Commander John Young uh, controlling the vehicle. Gear coming down. Touchdown, unofficial touchdown time for the main gear, uh, 10 07 Nose gear coming down. And gear contact. Nose down at 10 07 47 41. And STS 9 is home from the longest shuttle mission to date. Doors are coming open. Copy the doors. 